Hello, I'm here again to read another chapter from my book, Experiences from Life. We're on chapter seven. Uh, first of all, I will read the praise of the sermon that this chapter is based on. It's called Cause and Effect, and it's taken from a little trilogy that Maurice preaches on holiness. This is part three. Holiness is an effect, and all effects have causes. For example, Daffodils and tulips will come up in March because I planted bulbs in September. The effect is daffodils in spring, but I can't get that effect without a cause, bulb planting in autumn. If I have too many late nights, that becomes the cause of an effect, a headache. If I take an aspirin, that's another cause. The effect is that the headache goes, and so on. Every single effect in creation has a cause behind it. From this, we can learn a vital lesson. If we want an effect, we have to find a cause. Put the cause into operation and the, and the effect will come naturally without trying. Holiness is an effect, not a cause. So, if we want to become more like Jesus, more holy, then the very last thing we should do is try to be more like Jesus. That's the effect, not the cause. We changed from glory to glory. Change is a process. We change little by little, too slow for us to even notice the change. Here lies one of the reasons why so many of us fail. We hope that by one supreme effect, effort, we can now somehow manage to wrench ourselves out of our old lifestyle and behaviour and into holiness. But we only change if we keep on looking at Jesus' character. We're mirrors, and mirrors reflect whatever they're facing. We become what we are influenced by, whether we like it or not. I think that's a really, really good study. And it'd be good if you could hear Maurice preaching it, actually. You know, one of my outstanding characteristics was the ability to argue. I didn't care what method I used, logic or sarcasm, but I always made sure that I won, often leaving my opponent red in the face after hearing some home truths which I'd used completely out of context. Now, for some people, this characteristic could be classed as a quality, but for a Christian, this attitude can never be an attribute. I remember on one occasion when I was going through a Sunday school teacher training course that the tutor picked out six students to hold a debate. Three were to act as Pharisees and the other three were to act as disciples. I only wish that I'd been chosen to be a disciple instead of a Pharisee because I was really upset at my capacity to leave the disciples totally winded and without a leg to stand on. You know, it's quite amazing how wholeheartedly we can believe in something which logic and reason can totally disprove. I remember coming away from that particular class amazed that God had enabled me to become a believer. I had a hard time at work too. I just couldn't handle being told what to do. And would more often than not end up arguing with the boss and walking out. I didn't mean to act like this. I just had this inbuilt defect defense mechanism that made me act unafraid when I was scared to death. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. But throughout my life, I'd never known how to give a soft answer. Right from being a child, I was taught never to back down and admit defeat because people will walk all over you. And my parents showed me practically that this was the only way to survive. I knew that my attitude made me more enemies than friends, but how do you alter habits of a lifetime? I was very fortunate to land my job at the advertising agency. Nothing about it was mundane. It was a job in a million, and each day held stimulation and excitement. It was through working at this agency that I found myself involved with modeling, beauty contests, and all sorts of glamorous activities. And it was here that God used me to start a prayer meeting in the lunch break. But always at the back of my mind, I had this lurking feeling that it couldn't last and that before too long, my old nature would rear its ugly head and I'd argue with somebody important and be thrown out. I was constantly living in dread of God's grace being lifted from me. 
And although I didn't relish God's call to work for him full time, I also saw this as an opportunity to bow out of the firm gracefully for perhaps the first time in my working life. So, for the next five years, I spent my time serving the Lord and working entirely amongst Christians. The only time I ever mixed in the world was when I was out in an area distributing tracts in houses or meeting people who passed by and coming into the church during a co coffee morning. I had plenty of time to pray and study my Bible, write songs and record albums. And the usual topics of my conversations would be God, the church or Christianity. For a couple of years, I really did experience what it was like to be in the world and yet not of it. Because I was living by faith, I didn't have a regular income. In fact, this was a period in my life when I was living off other people's benevolence from week to week. Well, a couple of Christmases went by and I felt really embarrassed not being able to keep up my usual standards where gifts were concerned. So I decided that this year things would be different. I applied for a part-time job in the local Asda supermarket and I was allotted 12 hours work each week. I was then given my overall and my clock number, something which I'd never received at any of my previous employments. And I embarked on my first week with excitement at the prospect of working in a shop. During the course of this first week, I remember one of the men who worked there paying me a mildly crude sort of compliment, which left me both blushing and speechless. I wasn't embarrassed so much by what he'd said, I mean, sexual overtones are so much a part of male and female conversation in secular employment. What embarrassed me was the fact that I didn't know what to say in response to his comments. I could literally feel my mind searching for the quick-witted answers that came so ready, readily to my lips at one time. But it seemed as though in such a short space of time, I'd forgotten how to banter. A few weeks later, one of the female members of staff who'd taken a particular dislike to me said something which was really sarcastic and cutting. Now normally, I'd have been able to give far worse than I received, but once again, I found myself speechless, not knowing what to say. These incidents were quite disconcerting and caused me much thought. I certainly want, hadn't wanted to remain silent, neither had I wanted to argue, but somehow, I'd gone out of the swing of my usual impulsive outbursts and I had simply forgotten how to argue. I realised that for a couple of years prior to my employment in the store, I'd been mixing with Christians, where actions and conversations were all for and about God. Throughout this period, I'd not encountered sexual overtones and arguments during the course of a working day because my mind and the mind of others had been focused on holy and godly things. For years I'd prayed that God would help me to keep quiet when I was being provoked, yet no matter how hard I tried, my tongue had been too ready with a quick-witted answer. Yet here I was, marvelling at the fact that I hadn't risen to the bait when provoked on these two occasions. I came to a conclusion that it's far more effective to concentrate on doing something positive than on not doing something negative. Because without trying, God had changed me. Now, that's a miracle. If you really want to be holy, then find somebody who, who is holy and stick to them like glue. Maybe some of that holiness will rub off on you. God bless you.